Daryl, can you give us a bit more detail about GAP, your objectives, but also your policies? I tend to avoid labels, but in politics, a lot of people do get labelled, whether it be left wing or right wing. So can you tell, tell us a bit about how you position yourselves within the political spectrum and a bit of detail about the actual GAP party policies? Yeah, not a problem, Robert. The GAP is strictly middle of the road. We, we see the right, we see the left. But the law of this land through the Constitution dictates very clearly that there must be the middle road taken. You don't go extreme right, you don't go extreme left. Your lawmakers must have and maintain the middle of the road. Um, it's for the good of the whole of society and in, in doing so we educate those along those lines as to what the law dictates and we we ask the people when they vote at a referendum it'll be a question that will come about as a result of that middle of the road um, policy. So our policies um, for instance uh, with respect to transport will be what the Constitution grants and section 92 of the Constitution uh, talks about the absolute freedom of movement um, throughout the Commonwealth um, with respect to travelling for commerce um, interstate so there shouldn't be a restriction or a toll to travel from one state to the other with your commercial goods and therefore that must be adhered to. We don't like the way the states have been running their roads um, and their road infrastructure which includes their laws. Um, they're, they're clearly in breach of the inherited laws of this country that we inherited through England um, specifically the statute of monopolies and <clears throat> we see that there must be a national um, it's a national road network and therefore there must be a national set of laws and rules applied to those, ro those roads um, at the time of the constitution there was no motor vehicles like there are today and, and trucks there was mainly a concentration towards you know, rail traffic and ocean navigation. Um, but there was still um, that absolute freedom granted to movement among the state. And of course we have to adhere to what that law says and the parliament has, an, has the ability then to structure laws according to that. So there must be a national set of um, road laws and rules that uh, adhere to that law. With respect to health, um, <clears throat> again there has to be a, uh, a meeting of the minds when it comes to um, setting up a, a proper health system and of course that also entails quarantine which um, uh, brings about a um, a, a proper set of processes with respect to any incoming goods or people from other countries that may have a quarantinable disease or the like, they must be dealt with accordingly. Um, what we've seen with this, um, the events since uh, March 2020 is a step away from what the Constitution grants and of course there has been a, a sort of close adherence to it in one sense but um, in another sense uh, the, the the parliaments of the states have step, definitely stepped outside of that realm. So uh, our policies of course will be to bring that again back to a structure that the Commonwealth um, plays a strong role in and the Commonwealth, of course, um, instead of being neutralised with respect to the behaviour of the states, 
um, will be put back into that position of um, being the chief whip. So we'll be keeping those states in check and balance according to the law. Um, education, it's not something that was granted by the framers to the Commonwealth Government, but uh, and it was a, a residual power that was given to the states as such um, and they've operated that education. Our view towards education would be more towards um, a redefinition of our education. Um, we believe that there should be uh, a much earlier start to our children's education and that education um, ideally should be essentially hot housed in those first five years, um, teaching our children to communicate properly um, and to help them. It's, I guess it's similar to programming a computer. Um, in order for that computer to do the right job, you have to program that computer accordingly at the very beginning. So um, our policy is more towards a change to that education system accordingly so that um, uh, we have uh, our future population coming forward with a much better grasp on communication and um, what's going on where and, and, and how it's done. And in particular, um, we find that um, the study of law should be uh, a mandated um, subject um, throughout primary school and high school um, in order for an individual to be properly prepared to go out into the workforce. They should have a good knowledge of what government can and what government cannot do. So um, that's uh, an absolute um, must that uh, we focus on that education system. Um, you know, we've got, uh, with respect to trade, accordingly the constitution dictates how we um, conduct trade with other nations. So again, we come back to that constitution when it comes to trading. Um, with respect to uh, the <coughs> I guess um, uh, the behaviour of our states, um, that's definitely going to be on the focus of, of the Great Australian Party as, as far as what we present into that parliament. The standing of the um, Queensland parliament uh, and uh, calling them to show us their authority essentially. Uh, we know they won't be able to do that. Uh, the Queensland Parliament's probably the one parliament in all of Australia that's running so far from what the law prescribes that um, it's, it's just amazing that do they've got away with it for so long. Do you think we would expect to see an increased level of uh, Gap Party activity in Queensland as a result of that. I'm aware you're doing the promotional tours across Australia and of course you'll be attempting to raise your profile everywhere. Is Queensland a particular hotspot for want of a better term? Because of the way the Australian, the Queensland Parliament has been structured since 1922, yes. Um, our, our questions will be, um, particularly on the floor of the House of Parliament in the Senate or the lower house, will be why has this been allowed to take place? Why has the Queensland Parliament been able to eliminate its upper house when every other state in this country um, can show quite clearly that its state parliament has both a lower and upper house? Why has Queensland for so long been able to get away with this? What modelling have they used and was that modelling consistent with every other state in this country including the Commonwealth Parliament and of course uh, they, they cannot justify what they've done. Um, the, the, the people of Queensland in 1917 went to a referendum where the question put to them was will you allow us to dissolve the upper house of our parliament and the overwhelming result was no, you do not have permission to do that and of course they did. Um, regardless, and it's just gone by the by. 
ever since and it's just not good enough. Every single member of that federal parliament who comes from a seat in Queensland um, has got some questions to answer and that's, that's definitely going to be high on our agenda in order to bring this country into um, a proper state of affairs.